Well, thank you very much for joining me, Isaac Golden, and welcome to the Healing Hour. Thank you, Di. Lovely to be here. And so you are the Secretary of the Health Australia Party. At the moment, yes. We're following the election, there were some significant changes in our structure. And even though it's only been a few weeks, you know, things move on. We are going through a very big revalidation of membership process, which every party has to do after each election. So I've stepped into that particular role at the moment, uh, but I'm sure that'll change. Uh, really, you know, we are a, a, a group of volunteers. Uh, everyone is willing to do a little bit of everything, and that tends to be how these small groups work. And we take official positions, not necessarily because of the job description, but because you know they they needed to be filled at the at the time. As we grow, uh, as I'm sure we will, then you know we'll have new people moving on, and that's started to happen already. Actually, we've got one new member on the national executive already since the election. Right. And so, how and why did you become involved in this party? Okay. So I've been involved in natural medicine for over 30 years. My original professional training was in economics and financial accounting and I started practicing natural medicine and in particular homeopathy in 1984. And over the last 10 years and in Australia in particular in the last five years, uh, I've become increasingly concerned with the very um, coordinated well-funded, well-resourced attacks on all forms of natural medicine, particularly homeopathy, because it's, if you like, the easiest target. It's the, the least material of all of the therapies, but all of natural medicine. Mm -hmm. And a colleague and I, Professor Kerry Bone, some years ago uh, explored the possibility of starting a party. We didn't really get anywhere back then at the 2013 election, but a year ago, we really seriously discussed uh, the possibility of standing people at the 2016 election. There were many coincidences, if you like, that happened early in 2015, people being introduced to other people. And in July 2015, a group of six of us met in Melbourne. Two of them were the founders of the Natural Medicine Party, which they'd started in 2013, and there were another three plus myself. And we basically shared a common concern about where medicine in Australia is heading for a whole variety of reasons, which we can talk about if you like. And the, the founders of the Natural Medicine Party agreed that they would open up their existing party to broaden the scope, to change the name, to change the documentation, the website. And that's when the Health Australia Party was born. And the real stimulus was, as I said, the, the risks at which natural medicine faces itself in this country in particular. Uh, it's, it's not isolated to Australia. In fact, in 2005, there have, or well, since 2005, there have been very intense attempts in the United States to actually close down homeopathic hospitals and things like that. Uh, and America, of course, doesn't escape being the home of Big Pharma in many ways. So that's the reason why I became involved in the party. And I suppose I spent about 20 hours a week from July July this year, uh, working on it, and of course a month and a half before the election it was double that. So it's been a, a long uh, and fairly intense process, mm. and now that the this election is finished, we're going to reassess what happened. Uh, there were some pretty dirty tricks being played over the last three weeks. Uh, there was a lot of quite deliberate misinformation about the Health Australia Party being an anti-vaccination party, which was simply untrue. In fact, we state very clearly in our policy document that we support safe and effective immunisation. The one thing we don't support was the no jab, no pay legislation introduced by the federal government, 
But that's not because we're anti-vaccination. It's because we believe that people's human rights demand that they be allowed, without coercion, to make informed consent before any invasive medical procedure, not just vaccination, any medical procedure. And interestingly, when the Senate held their um, committee meetings and their review and called for submissions, when you look at the submissions, there are orthodox medical people there raising exactly the same or very similar concerns that we have about this legislation and whether or not this really is the best way to improve vaccination rates in Australia. And the Law Institute of Victoria put forward an excellent submission based on human rights. So th there's a difference in being concerned about a piece of legislation because of its human rights impl implications. That doesn't make you anti-vax, but yet that was the misinformation that was put out about us and, and we were told following the election by our volunteers who were on the polling booth that time and time again people would come up to them and say, oh, you're the anti-vax party. And it made a huge difference. We lost, mm. uh, you know, probably a couple of hundred thousand votes because of that. So. Yes, yeah, definitely. And so the party's not just um, looking at what other areas um, well, we are, on? but we're looking, at, we're looking at health differently because we have five pillars and they're all related to health, but health in a different way than people often imagine it. So the first one is healthy people, that's what you would expect, but then we have healthy economy, healthy environment, healthy democracy and healthy society and we believe those, those five elements must come together for a, a country like Australia to be true. It's like a very holistic view of what we mean by health. It's like in people. You can't say, okay, your liver's not healthy, your kidney is, therefore, you know, you're not too bad. Mm. We have to look at health in people on the intellectual, the emotional and the physical level and just in a, in a similar kind of way with the whole country. We have to look at health in every major aspect. So we certainly are not a single issue party, although the, the health system, as we understand it, is yeah. enormously important to us. But mm. as I said, my own background was in economics, so healthy uh, economy is very important. We have, I think our policy document runs to 17 pages. Seven of those pages have to do with the environment. So we actually have very, very strong environmental policies. Mm. And when one looks at the healthy democracy, that's incredibly important because if nothing else, one thing we learned from this election was how biased the mainstream media is in the sense that there are certain big players, I suppose people who spend a lot of money advertising, uh, yeah. who get the first say of what runs in the newspaper. Mm. And the newspaper campaigns, there were no journalists interested in looking at the real truth about what they were saying about the Health Australia Party. But this also included the ABC, uh, the Drum and a couple of other ABC outlets that mm. ran the same line that the Murdoch press were running, for example. There was no difference. Right, they, wow. We were an anti and it simply was untrue. Yes, yes. You had some criticism saying that the um, the party was dangerous, and so I guess that is linked to that sort of vaccine side of things. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add to that comment? Yeah, very much so. I mean, they said firstly, and this is the AMA who said this, uh, that we were inappropriately named and being caught talking about health. Well, I think we're the most appropriately named party of the whole lot. Um, the in terms about the side of things, well, this is more than just vaccination. And, you know, it became very clear to me that the vaccination lie was a very convenient way of attacking the party because if the AMA had come out and said, oh, we don't like this party because they want to see more natural medicine, because they want to have natural, properly trained and accredited natural medicine practitioners in the mainstream health system, 
then a lot of people said, well, would have said, well, you know, we want to see that as well. Use natural medicine. I mean, we know that 60% of Australians use some form of natural medicine. Mm. Now, some of those would just be vitamins and minerals from the health food store or the, these days mm. in the supermarket. Mm. Um, but, you know, a good percentage would be people who actually see all forms of natural therapists. So they probably realise that they couldn't attack us on the natural medicine front. So the anti-vaccination side of things was convenient. Right. Um, unfortunately, uh, one of our candidates had uh, left on social media a whole lot of un unfortunate um, tweets, social media tweets. And my own position, which is that we should use safe and effective immunisation options that people should have choice, mm. uh, was of course going to be liable to be um, misconstrued intentionally. Mm. You see, I've done work for 30 years on uh, a form of natural immunisation which is now used by governments around the world in millions of people. Really? In fact, oh yes, that's, in April this year, the Indian government flew me at their expense mm. to India to advise on a big um, dengue fever immunization program which is now running in Kerala state. Right, so, fantastic. Uh, wow, I, that's very promising. I, well, I strongly support immunization against mm. potentially serious diseases. I've been mm. to Cuba four times collecting data on their massive uh, homeopathic immunization program. Right. But that doesn't make me anti-vaccination. It makes me someone who wants to see people protected against potentially serious diseases. Yeah. I have patients who vaccinate, they have my full support. I have patients who don't, they have my full support. But you see, the problem was that um, this sort of thing was being used, probably particularly the direct comments, but it was being used inappropriately to say that the party was anti-vaccination, which is just simply untrue. Right, yeah. And so where's the party going from now? The, the election's all over? Um, yep. And what's the next step? Yep. Look, following every election, the Australian Electoral Commission does a validation of the membership base of most political parties. So right now we're in the very significant process of revalidating our membership base. Uh, I, a couple of weeks ago I sent emails out to two and a half thousand people. Um, and we're contacting people who we haven't heard back from to make sure that when our time comes around for the next audit by the AEC that we'll be ready and prepared for it. We obviously are reviewing what happened in the election because we have to make sure that the next time where the party either stands in a state election or a federal election, we will anticipate a similar sort of uh, misinformation campaign and we have to be better prepared for it than we were. We thought we actually were prepared for it but we just didn't realise the extent to which uh, different players were drawn in. We even had the Greens, uh, mm. Richard D. Farley from the Greens attacking us a I few days that. before the election. Once again, just repeating the same AMA line mm. uh, without really knowing you know, the, the people who reported this line mm. never bothered to investigate what the actual truth was. Yes, yeah. Um, if I can say from a patient's point of view, I know that uh, I'm in touch with a lot of people uh, around Australia who have had health problems and a lot of things that aren't being addressed. And it confuses me when I hear these people in these big positions saying, how dangerous natural medicine can be because um, there, is, there are so many people that I talk to each day who are going to hospitals, they're going to doctors and they're actually not getting any better and they're turning to natural health um, and they're using it either alternatively or complementary and they're getting great success. And so these people who are criticising your party, they seem to be very out of touch with the patients and what's actually happening in Australia with um, many people who are really suffering. Yeah, well, we are great supporters of integrative medicine, and we state this in our policy documents. 
that we want to see a system where the best of all forms of medicine can be made available to people and people have the choice if they want to go one way or the other um, getting unbiased advice from the experts in, the, in each of the different fields. So, you know, there's much merit in uh, aspects of pharmaceutical medicine. I mean, the emergency care medicine in mm. Australia is world class. There's Absolutely. no two ways about that. Yeah, I have the to agree. I have to agree yeah. and really, really uh, emphasise that point. Um, you know, even a few months ago, my daughter was unwell when we were away. I thought, right, let's just get straight to the doctor. And it was really fabulous service. Um, yeah. Even though I have been very disappointed with some areas of, of really on the chronic health side of things, yeah. um, I have That's to say... That's where the problem lies, mm. in chronic illness, because we have an epidemic of chronic illness in this country. Absolutely. Which is not recognised in the mainstream media. Now... I know that one of the AMA people who attacked uh, the Health Australia Party said that we claim this, but yet, you know, they gave a couple of references to sites in orthodox medicine that talked about chronic illness. But the bottom line is, the truth is, that in the mainstream media, we don't hear about the extent of chronic illness in mm, Australia. Absolutely. And this is where modern medicine does not do well. So it does very well in acute emergency care. It does much less well in chronic treatment and in some cases even cure. Mm. Because orthodox medicine, pharmaceutical medicine, is based on the suppression of symptoms. And unfortunately, when you suppress the body's natural self-healing mechanism, it can drive disease forces deeper. And this is where there can be a connection with chronic problems. And we see this in every country around the world where yeah. pharmaceutical medicine is used widely. So it's great that we reduce the infant mortality rate. It's great that we can save people in emergency situations that otherwise would have died, you know, even 50 years ago. Mm. What isn't great is that people are becoming more and more dependent on drugs. Now, they may be legal drugs, but that doesn't make them any better. Yeah. And you know, it's a wonderful business model when you think about it for the pharmaceutical companies. You reduce the infant mortality rate, you make people live for as long as possible, and you make them as dependent as possible on medication to keep functioning. Do you That's think, a business model. Do you think they would actually be doing that? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes, of course and, they would. And how do, they, how do you think that's, um, you know, they must be pulling the wool over somebody's eyes. Is it just... I mean, how is well, this happening if we're, yeah. um, you know, the Australian public, we're, we're not silly. So how are we being fooled by thinking that we need all these drugs? Well, it's very simple. Many people do need drugs. If they're not going to do other options, if they're not going to improve their health in general, they do need drugs to keep functioning, whether it's for, you know, high blood pressure, when they become adult, uh, diabetics, etc., etc., all of which are mostly preventable diseases. Well, our health system has done a very poor job at preventing these types of chronic disease. You know, chronic kidney disease, chronic liver disease. The, the, the runs are not on the board for prevention. Mm. And so that means that people do become dependent on drugs. Yes. Look, the bottom line is, though, and this is one of the main reasons why we felt the Health Australia Party was so important, is that the information that most politicians and health bureaucrats get is information which has been heavily tainted by the pharmaceutical industry. Now, they're not my words. Mm -hmm. They're words from people like, for example, the Edward Safra uh, Ethics Lab at Harvard University. They're the words of people like Professor John Ioannidis, who's one of the leading researchers in misinformation uh, being developed by pharmaceutical research. Mm -hmm. So the problem we have is that the media in this country is complicit. The politicians probably don't really know because all of the advice they're getting is from, based on information which is being tainted. And most people who rely on what their doctor tells them, what they hear in the media, 
etc., uh, etc. Et they believe what they're told. For example, um, a silly, a funny little example, but I uh, was up at Mount Macedon playing golf on Saturday, and afterwards we were having a bit of chat, and some of the men were asking me how the party went. And I talked about this, and, and there was a fellow there who basically said, but, you know, we were told you were anti-vax. That's what everyone said. And I said, well, it doesn't mean it's true. But you see, this is the problem. Yeah. The health information that people get in this country is very, very distorted. This has been validated, as I said, by the, the study at Harvard University, which looked, they did 16 different articles. One of them was on the advertising and the, and the media manipulation by Big Pharma. And it's impressive. You know, it is magnificent the way that they've done it. The problem is that we're the losers. They're the winners. We yeah. are the loop. Yeah. And you have to break this cycle somehow. Mm. And this is, we still feel that representation on the floor of parliaments in the state and in the federal sphere is absolutely essential. So we can eyeball other politicians and say, well, look, you know, you haven't been given the full truth. Yes, absolutely. Well, that's, that's a, a big job when you've got so much in the media and the politicians who either don't want to know or they haven't been informed properly. It is, and the only way we're really going to make this happen, if it is going to happen over the next decade, is through the patients who are using yes. natural medicine. Yes. We're seeing natural medicine practitioners. Yeah. And we need to inform the practitioners about what we're trying to do and get them on side so that they'll educate their patients and say and say to the patients before the next election, look you're going to hear all these stories about the Health Australia Party. Mm. Every time you hear someone come out and say the Health Australia Party is an anti-vaccination party, then you need to realise that what you're being told is simply untrue, that they are not, and this is an example of the pressure that's being brought to try and prevent safe and natural medicine being used mm. alongside the best of pharmaceutical medicine, the best of modern medicine. We're not saying use what we have and don't use, you know, the best of modern medicine. Mm. At times, antibiotics are life-saving. At times, you know, if I get hit by a truck, I don't want to see my local homeopath or aromatherapist. Yeah, I want to see yeah. the doctor in the hospital. Yeah. So, you know, we're not, we are calling for the best of all forms of medicine to be used. You know, I mentioned I've been to Cuba four times researching their immunisation programs. I also got a chance to see their general health system, which in many ways is better than ours. Now, they are a relatively poor country. They only have a quarter of GDP per head that Australia does. But yet, they don't have the huge waiting lists. Mm. Their people can see experts for prompt attention to both acute and chronic medicine. Now some of their hospitals, the paint's peeling on the walls. They don't always have, you know, the latest uh, machines, although they, they're a very high-tech country when it comes to health. But they have a wonderful system where the doctors there in hospitals and in clinics can use whatever form of medicine they want. So if they want to use homeopathy, if they want to use acupuncture, herbal medicine, nutrition, they can do that with the full support of the health system. Wow. And that it costs less and functions better than our system does. Mm. Look at America and people say, oh, how dreadful the system is there because per head of, po of population, it's the most expensive health system in the world, but yet their longevity rates are actually coming down now. They're reversing. You know, their chronic yes, yes. rates are absolutely shocking. Mm. But we in Australia will be where the Americans are now if we don't do something about it. We I can't think to the AMA and groups like that to do it. Yeah. They won't do it. No, I think it's actually it's becoming that way because the, like you say, there is a crisis in with chronic health in Australia. I'm talking to people every day, and it's heartbreaking to hear the the really serious uh, chronic health problems that so many people have, and 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 going to see doctors to see specialists, and they're brushed aside if if the the doctor or the specialist isn't able to help them with with the tools that they have. They they just brush them aside. They don't suggest, oh, maybe you can 
try this or try something else. And so many hundreds of people are really in a desperate situation. I think it's um, and to hear the um, you know the anger and the the fierce attack that is happening towards natural medicine from the established side of of medicine, it's um it's really quite disturbing for myself as a patient and for many of these hundreds of other people who are really desperately looking for um, answers and they are finding help and assistance on the natural side of things. Well generally that's because a good natural therapist, whatever their modality, is there to empower the patient, to take control of their own health, is there to assist the patient's own self-healing mechanism to work better. I always say to my patients, you know, the, the pills and the potions that I give you are not going to cure you, but what they will do is they will support the, the, the God-given self-healing mechanism that you were born with that will help it to do the job that it would do if it wasn't stressed. And so, you know, we talk about distress well, you know, what we're talking about is uh, millions of people in this country and around the world whose self-healing mechanisms have stopped functioning in the way they need to. Because, you know, I always used to say when I used to do a lot of lecturing uh, to students, you know you're successful when you become redundant. In other words, you know, when you, a patient no longer needs you, yes. then you know you've done a good job. And they'd say, oh, but look, if we do that, we, we won't have a business. And I would always say, I can tell you right now, if you can get patients to the point where they don't need to take your medicine anymore, you will be overwhelmed with patients. Absolutely. Because they'll tell a dozen other people who'll tell another dozen. Yeah, fantastic. And I think that's that's the thing, like you say, people have have become so dependent on, on medication that they don't even realise I mean, my own experience of, of health and healing, I mean, six years ago I nearly died and I never thought that my body would be able to heal as well as it has done. And that's mainly been through natural medicine. Um, of course, like I said, I think it's absolutely wonderful to have the um, mainstream medicine available if need be, but it's it was about, for me, um, you know, really helping my own own body, my own immune system, yeah. everything to start functioning. And it, it's incredible how much heal, self-healing ability we have. We have a chance. Mm. See, it shouldn't be a competition. And this is, once again, going back to the Cuban situation. The thing that's missing from the Cuban health system compared to every other, just about every other system in the world, is that in Cuba, there's no profit motive in the health system. Ah. And that makes a massive difference. So in other words, what the doctors do is purely in the best interests of the patients. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that the average GP is, you know, a money hungry hungry person who's, you know, doesn't care about their patients, because I know that's not true. The average GP is someone who cares about their patients. Some of the specialists, I don't know about that. But you know, the, but the health system, I'm talking about the system now, not individual people within it. You know, the Cuban system being free of that financial incentive to drive profit, 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 means that the people working in the system are free to do what they see as the best thing for the patient. Mm. It's a wonderful system. But we can do it here, and mm. people can still make profits. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a small business free enterprise person. I was brought up um, you know, by a father who uh, started a finance company. So I'm all for, uh, for for business and making appropriate profits. But health, unfortunately, has now been dominated by these massive international companies that, you know, that, that make billions and billions of dollars a year. They it's pay it. Sorry, billions it's of dollars a year in fines. Yeah. Fines yeah. that would normally cripple the average company. But for them, it's a week's you know, turn over. Yes, yeah. And it seems that it's not just the pharmaceutical. I mean, you look at the environment, you look at businesses, the big corporations seem to be taking over everything and getting getting rid of the little people. Well, when I say yes. the little people, but uh, I mean, I was just speaking... What, what to, you mean? I was just yeah. speaking to someone yesterday who works for um, a power company and he said that 
um, they're, they're trying to get rid of all the workers and I'm not sure how they're going to replace them but um, yeah he said that you know he's been talking to, to people who are in the know and um, you know things are being sold out I think it's you look at the coal seam gas that's going all over Australia and, and so many farms that are being destroyed See, in this water. Is, this is why with the Health Australia Party we have a very strong pro small business platform and even the Prime Minister acknowledged and the Treasurer acknowledged that small business drive the economy. You know, it, it's massive, the amount of employment, but yet there are a growing number of disincentives. And so that supporting, if we want a healthy economy, we need a level playing field for small business as well as the big corporations. The big corporations have their place, but any big organisation is capable of corrupting influences. And that applies to big unions as well as big corporations. So they all have their place. And government has a place to ensure that the playing field is level. And that's not what's happening at the moment. We need to free up small business. Not so that they can exploit individual working people who don't have much say, but so that they can compete reasonably levelly paying field with the big corporations where the small business people have a chance rather than being you know just flooded with cheap prices that they just can't uh, cope with mm. if they're freed from a lot of the unnecessary bureaucracy they'll be much better able to compete with the big businesses and that'll be for the benefit of everyone in australia mm. that's what we mean by healthy economy yes well it seems a bit a bit like a david and goliath battle Yes, well, um, David won, <laughs> so God willing, I, I haven't got a slingshot with a stone hewn by no human's hand, one and part of the book says, yeah. but um, yeah, look, it's going know, to be very difficult, but it, know, it's not possible. Yeah. Do you know round about how many votes you ended up with? We ended up, if you exclude the so-called donkey vote from New South Wales, where uh, we drew the first preference, and so you get an extra 0.5 to 1% of votes, so-called donkey vote, if you get the number one spot. If you exclude that, we would have got about 50,000 first preference votes right. in the four states where we stood. It'll be interesting to see once the AEC has finished the Senate count, if we can work out how many second or third preference votes we got. It's just impossible to guess. Mm. Uh, you know what that might be mm. so it was not nearly enough I, I th as I said before I think that the the big misinformation campaign cost us probably at least 200,000 votes in the mm. four states and possibly more because right. of the numbers of people who are going to polling booths with that word on their mouth you know you're the anti-vax party mm. well, when, you, when we talk about the anti-vaccination um, you know, I was looking into something the other day, and there's actually warnings. I mean, like you say, you're, you're pro-choice and you're pro-safe immunisation. I was looking into um, a few things about vaccination, and I came across a warning from the American College of Pediatrics, uh, warning against the Gardasil vaccine or the HPV vaccine. And there was another one... I don't have it with me at the moment, but I mean, they they were, you know, some pretty heavy warnings against these vaccinations. And so, I mean, even if... Yeah, well, look, the, the thing is this, that all you need to do is look at the 20 countries other than Australia that have vaccine damage compensation schemes. And when you look at those 20 countries, Australia is one of only three developed countries that does not have a vaccine damage compensation scheme, which makes the no jab, no pay legislation, by the way, even worse in the sense that there is economic coercion to vaccinate, but no support, you know, no vaccine damage co compensation scheme. But when you look at those 20 countries that have vaccine damage compensation scheme, They've paid out billions, literally billions of dollars. Mm. And these are governments paying money to people who the government acknowledge have been vaccinated. Mm. So 
I, I don't uh, give talks about problems with vaccines. I, on my website, I don't rail against vaccines. All I need to do is point to evidence that's there that other people have collected to say, look, there is a cause for some concern. There's a, yeah. a, a cause to allow people to make informed consent, to make conscientious objections to certain procedures. And I don't mean just vaccination, by the way. Mm. I believe any forced in medical intervention, particularly an invasive medical intervention, right. a person should have the freedom to make an informed consent or to say, no, thank you. Yes. I don't yes. want to do this. That's where we're coming from. Mm. So it's not about vaccination. It's about the ethics and the morals of coercing people to do things against their will which involve invasive medical procedures. Right. And there does seem to be quite a bit of money behind these pushes for, for all sorts of different medications. I've, I know I've looked into a few different areas and there are billions of dollars being made from certain drugs, well from many drugs. Absolutely. Once again, one doesn't need to resort to conspiracy theories and this is why I would you know once again direct your listeners to the Harvard University study because it's the best that's ever been done mm -hmm. on the effect of pharmaceutical multinationals on medical systems around the world including Australia right, and so I think every G every doctor in mm -hmm. the first year of study they should be made to read this and realise that what they're going to be told in medical school, some of it is absolutely questionable because it's based on research which has been fabricated, which has been tampered with. And so if people are interested in what I'm talking about, if they just Google Harvard University pharmaceutical ethics, they'll almost certainly come up with the Edward or was it Edmund Safra, S A W F R A Ethics Lab in Harvard University Law School, and they'll be able to read. It's all freely available online. But if anyone's really serious about, including Orthodox doctors who may be listening and, mm. and think what I'm saying is a lot of rubbish, mm. if they're genuinely concerned about this, have a look at it because it will change everyone who reads it. It is so well done. It is so free of conspiracy theories. It is so evidence based. This is the sort of information our politicians need that they just aren't getting. Yeah, it, it seems, it really just seems beyond grasp that the whole medical establishment has a lot of information based on a lie. Can that be possible? That, that yeah. the, way, the way a lot of the medical establishment is functioning um, has been misinformed. There's lot, so much misinformation there. When, when you're looking at people who are who are dedicating their lives and they're studying uh, many years in in highly um, skilled areas. Well, you see, the average GP does not have time to do independent research. And to be honest with you, why would they have the incentive? Because they see certain people, certain doctors, qualified doctors around the world who have spoken out against uh, aspects of orthodox medicine who have been viciously attacked and who have often lost their licenses to practice medicine, who have been hounded from their country at times. So there are many examples of whistleblowers within orthodox medicine who have paid a very severe price. The pharmaceutical uh, industry does not allow whistleblowers and that that includes orthodox doctors within the system. But apart from that, they don't have the time. Mm. You know, they study intensively for six plus years. They run up massive debts. They have to get out there and, and they begin by working in hospitals. And they've got no spare time. You know, some of them are working 20 hour shifts. And then they get into their own private practice with massive debts related to their study most of the time. They have to just work, work, work. And then you've got on top of that the disincentive that they see from whistleblowers 
You know, I was asked by a number of people, what's the first bit of legislation I would bring in if I'd been elected as a senator and had the choice? And it would have been to do with the protection of whistleblowers. Because I think that's the only way that we can have a truly open and honest society. If the people who are brave enough, in whatever field, not just medicine, in whatever field, who are brave enough to stand up, knowing that they're going to lose friends and reputation, but still stand up and, and expose corruption and improper practices. They're the people we need to support, I believe, and that would go a long way over time to changing the culture in orthodox medicine. But the fact is that a lot of so-called evidence-based medicine that we are told is so wonderful, when you look at the actual evidence base, it's very weak, it's very tampered with. Uh, and I know that you know people will be angry hearing me say mm. that, but it's the truth. And yes. we have evidence that it's the truth. Yes. That's the and there's a part of me that doesn't want to believe you. There's a part of me that thinks this can't be real. But I know from my own experience that um, I 100% support what you are saying. As, a, as someone who's been on the patient side of things virtually my whole life, um, unfortunately I have had a lot of ill health my whole life and I've had virtually every medical procedure they could give me. I've had virtually every natural procedure or medication remedy zapping and all sorts of things that I could have and um, I fully support the work you're doing because from my experience and from hundreds, thousands of other people's experience is that they are improving using natural remedies, that they are getting their lives back, they're going out and living, living, enjoying their life thank you to natural remedies and so I think Science has gone so far that they've lost touch with what's actually happening for the person. And that's what really what, what the medical establishment is there for, to improve people's health. It isn't really there to tell everybody what they have to do or what works or what doesn't work. I mean, if the people aren't experiencing that, then it, it really doesn't mean anything. Yeah, look, it, it's, it's a very difficult to talk about this without sounding like a conspiracy theorist. I hate conspiracy theories. We don't need conspiracy theories. We need evidence. And, you know, the, the manipulation of the media, the manipulation of the evidence base is not the responsibility or is, is not being caused by the average GP, the average orthodox medical person on the front line. And it's very important to understand that. But unfortunately, they are affected by it and unfortunately our political masters really have no idea what's going on mm. and I mean in America they have a different system to ours um, some of the senators and congressmen over there openly receive massive amounts of money from drug companies to promote certain bits of legislation which means that more pharmaceuticals are sold mm. it's not as blatant as that here I don't believe that our system, our, our political system, is nearly as corrupted at all as the, medic, as the American system is in that regard. Mm. But, you know, the bottom line is that information is power, and the information in Australia is being controlled by people who have severe vested interests, and certainly not the interests of the average person at heart. Mm. And so that's what we're trying to do in the Health Australia Party. If, if enough people who use natural medicine can put aside the misinformation they hear and when the next time they go to a polling booth think about their choice, do they want freedom to choose the forms of health care they want as well as freedom in other areas. As I said, economy, environment, democracy and society, our five pillars along with healthy people. Uh, then I believe that we will give them something to, uh, an alternative to consider. And that's all we're trying to do. Well, all the very best. And um, it's the first time I've ever been drawn to be politically involved. <laughs> I, I have stayed... That's me too, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I've stayed well away from politics. And as soon yeah. as I heard... I mean, I, I only heard about your 
maybe a week or I think of less than a week before the election and I tell you what there was a huge buzz a lot of excitement and I know that there is a huge amount of support um, for your party and I think once the word gets out a little bit more I mean I'm I think the election itself was a huge advertisement um, maybe people didn't really quite know who you are or what you were doing up until the actual election but um, is there's certainly been a bit of a stir about it and people are very excited so I'm sure you're going to do very well in the future. Thank you. Well, we are going to continue. We are going to do our best to try and give people options and, and it's very encouraging to hear what you've got to say. Thank you for that. I can actually hear my next patient has just walked in the door so <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to have to pop away. Thank you, thank so, you so much, much for this opportunity. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. it's been great talking to you and I look forward to catching up soon and maybe have some, some updates along the way. Yes, by all means. You just let me know and I'll be very happy to do that. Fantastic. Thank you very okay. much. Isaac Golden from the Health Australia Party. Thank you, Di. Bye-bye.